Welcome back to the Compassionate Capitalist Show. So here we are. We're almost at the mid-year hump. Okay, that means we're about halfway through the year in another week or so. We just wrapped up uh, Memorial Day weekend and we are about to our midway spot. So this is a great time for you as my humble listener and my this the, your humble host to say, if you have not yet taken your first step to become understanding what angel investing is and to become an angel investor at whatever is the right approach for you, then you do that. Do that right now. Today, go get Inside Secrets to AngelInvesting.com or my book, Inside, Inside Secrets to Angel Investing, but you can get it at the .com. And if you're, not, you're still not a little certain, then you can go get the 12 secrets. Okay, so I have 44 secrets in Inside Secrets to Angel Investing. I put 12 of them. I pulled 12 of them out and I explained them in a little free ebook that you can get at bit.ly. Okay, bit.ly, get 12 secrets ebook. And all the words have a capital in them. And the number 12 is a 12, but it's, of course, it's in the show notes. So I decided when I realized it's how, because I'm running a promo that has a deadline of June 15th, middle of June, thereabouts. And I said, you know what? I should take this show on this Tuesday before that, as we enter into our hump month. This is, you know, Wednesday's the hump day of, of the week. Well, June's the hump month of the year, okay? So you're kind of like right there in the middle. And it is the time that angel investors and angel investor groups out there are pull, kind of rambling together. Like they know how much money they intend to invest this year. And they're trying to get to a point of narrowing down their list of the companies they've been looking at up till now so they can narrow that focus and spend the remainder of the year, maybe there'll be one or two other ones that pop in, but getting to close, right? And, and you know, through their pipeline. So this, and before everybody starts taking off on vacations in July. So I said, you know what? I'm going to, I've got this promo that I'm going to be running. It's a special deal for the people that have bought my book and signed up for the resource portal. So I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to tell you, what you why you need to do that. But I, before I lose your interest, let me say, I'm going to explain to you what angel investing is. And it, it dawned on me when a couple of aha moments I had in the last year or so in, you know, we've had these black swan events that happen and get us an opportunity to reassess. And I, I have this mission and this passion to create the compassionate compassionate capitalist movement and it's not happening the way i envisioned it to happen it hasn't happened at the speed that i envisioned it to happen the the my book although it's a bestseller hasn't become the phenom success that created that launched a movement as i had intended it to be for a lot of different reasons but one of my aha moments is that people out there just don't know what angel investing is they don't know what an angel investor is and I've been so involved with angel investing for 15, 20 years. And I, I move in and out of the circles with angel investors and venture capitalists and startups and businesses that are growing and looking for capital. They, sometimes you take for granted that other people know about this. But when I realized, and I put the kind of like put my two, two, two plus two together and it wasn't equaling five, I needed to figure out how to get it to equal four. And I realized that the 7 million people out there that collect a W-2 paycheck of over $250,000 in the United States, that 6.8 million of those have never heard of angel investing. And the reason why millennials, when they come to my presentations where I'm talking about angel investing and I'm, and my, you know, I'm, when I come in and I'm a keynote or have an opportunity to talk on stage and I compare angel investing to real estate, to stocks, to even ICOs, they always ask, what about crowdfunding investing? And so I said, you know what, I'm going to take this few minutes that I have here where I have your attention and thank you again for listening. And I'm going to explain that. 
And I'm going to give you some numbers that are going to explain to you why you need to add investing in entrepreneurs as an asset class to your portfolio of investments. If you have liquidity to be buying real estate, to be investing in the stock market, whatever that might be, even putting tens of thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars into ICOs, you have the ability and the liquidity and the smarts to begin becoming an angel investor. Baby steps, right? And here's the reason why. So first of all, an angel investor, the textbook definition of it is, is through a term called accredited investor that was established back in the 1930s when in reaction to the stock market crash of the Great Depression, right? The, they, there had been all, there weren't a lot of rules on, on stocks and public stocks and how they could be sold and what needed to be disclosed and, and the level of transparencies with potential buyers. And so you have these fear and, and, and there was a lot of fear associated with it that swung markets. And there was a lot of uh, misinformation that swung markets. And so the SEC established laws that said, this is what you have to do if you're going to sell a stock on a public market. But there was a carve out to that, that the very wealthy out there said, you know what, we are investing in the, in the growth of a nation, in the transportation, in hotels, in automobiles, in, you know, inventions that, you know, electricity or, you know, things that use electricity and, and guns and uh, medical advancements and so many things that we take for granted today were um, initially funded not by government and innovation, because guess who becomes the innovators? Capitalists, capitalists that look at a problem and want to try to solve that problem and make money doing it. And so the very wealthy at that time said, we want to fund that. My buddy that does hotels and wants to put a new hotel in. My buddy that makes cars wants to make a new kind of car, a new kind of engine or a new kind of tire, or, you know, they all of these different things that are new and innovative. They were the rich, help the rich get richer because they would invest in them. And they wanted to have a carve out in a way to do that. And that was called Reg D. And I talk about this in my book. I have all this stuff, but there, the, the part of the angel side of it came because those real wealthy people were also philanthropists and they would invest in plays and theaters and things like that, that were for their entertainment. Um, and they were considered angel investors. They didn't necessarily need to get, want a return on it. If it was highly successful, they get a return, but it was more, you know, they wanted to run in the circles of being um, benevolent to these art, art organizations. And that continues on today. So that's how the Reg D, which is primarily known as 504 and 506, the other ones are various other, uh, you know, things within that, that, that um, established the rules and the lanes. And, um, and that's where angel investing has been for the last, you know, since the 1930s, like probably 100 years. Okay, well, not by 30s, so not 70 years, right? 60 years, okay, to 1980s, the 1980s, right? When we started to have the precursor of the technology movement, and which ultimately became the dot-com bubble. And you saw a lot of flood of, market, of, of capital into the market to, you know, again, the rich got richer, right? Because they knew about these deals. And part of the rules that you had with angel investing or accredited investors and entrepreneurs raising capital is that they had to have, they could not general solicit. If they were going to be a private transaction that wasn't, subject to the rules of the public stock market, then they had to keep it private. So that entrepreneur had to know that investor or that person or that organization, that stockbroker that was telling the investor about it had to have that connection. And angel investor groups were able to establish that because they had a screening process and it was a network. And so they got exemptions from that because you could stand, you could present to this group of investors that all knew each other, even though you only knew them because you applied there, right? So that's kind of sort of the world of angel investing until we had the great recession. 
right? So let me, before I get into that, so let me think of this in other ways, because some of you may have heard of this. If you're listening to, you're not that familiar with angel investing. You may have heard the term silent partner, right? That's where somebody becomes a silent partner in that business down the street. So-and-so is opening up a restaurant. So-and-so is opening up a new a uh, clothing store. So-and-so is opening up a hattery or they're opening up a, a, you know, a bed and breakfast, right? And they get silent partners to give them money and they get paid out either in a loan that gets paid back because they didn't go to a bank or they get paid back in a percentage of the revenue until X amount is paid, right? This, this, um, and, and it had always been done on a revenue cycle type of a thing. Um, oftentimes until a company, because the only other way was a company got acquired or they got, or they got, they went public. And then you would have an exit that was, that was based off of an alternative, you know, another type of market valuation, the mar- it reached a pinnacle and an exit event happened. And those investors, as well as the founders, you know, received the benefit of that increased value of that stock when that transaction happened. But, you know, as a silent partner, not that wasn't always the case. You just would be a partner in this and get a percentage of the revenue and other perks. And that had been, that's gone away from that because of the way the inside, the rich got richer and how the angel investor market expanded, right? And then you have also, if you, multiple business ownership, if you've read Cashflow Quadrant, that was uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki and Sharon Lecter's book that talked about the, the way the wealthy become wealthier is putting their money to work for them by investing in, in one, in real estate that produces an income, but also investing in other businesses that produce an income. So you don't have to be working nine to five to be getting paid because somebody else is working nine to five and paying you a percentage of their revenue. So that's the cash flow quadrant. The right side of quadrant. I talk about that a lot because I love that concept. And so that's kind of where that eight, you know, it's a, a multi, you know, investing in multiple business ownership, a uh, silent partner. And then you have the, uh, you, there's also sometimes you can talk about private equity investors, but those are usually larger. It gets, gets muddled into institutional type of money. Sometimes people talk about venture capitalists and sometimes people will call themselves a venture capitalist where a venture capitalist is really defined as somebody who's managing other people's money um, in a fund with a mission to invest in certain kinds. They have a very strict mission of what it is that they're investing in and stages. It's based on their prospectus of how they got all those investors to give them the money to then go back to invest it. Then you have, sometimes you'll have fundless managers, fundless venture managers. Those are really, those are actually just finders that have a bunch of rich friends that say, hey, when you find a deal, tell us about this, right? Get, show it to us, okay? And that's not really a structured angel group. It's just private investors. And there's, you know, just pro- alternative investors. Sometimes you'll hear that word, but more often it's used for people that invest in speculative things like um, like uh, oil industry or uh, any kind of in the, in the um, energy space or in the mining space, but those are all still, there might be limited partnerships in an LLP where they're the limited partner and a managing partner, but they're still in the realm of angel investing because they're, so by definition, my definition of an angel investor is anybody that's taking their own money and putting it into a private entity that the equity of that private entity, either lo- they can be loaning them money they can be doing something through royalty financing. So it's not a debt instrument, but it's it's kind of, it's backed by the equity, but they get paid off in a hybrid between the value of, a, of an equity play and a debt play. And then there's straight up equity that's just waiting until that exit happens. So there's really kind of three ways that you play in there. And now you get into the world of crowdfunding and that's all another, another gamut that we're going to talk about. But so that is, so that's really what an angel investor is. And here's the reality of it is that in, tw- in 2012, the stock market, well, in 2008 to 2009, 2010, the stock market, you, you recall, that was our great recession, not the depression, but the recession. And all of our financial markets, our real estate markets had collapsed. There was a plummet in stock value. And our Congress and the president at the time, uh, under the Obama administration, and in a very bipartisan way, they passed the Jobs Act. 
And it took a long time for the SEC to work through the rules because they their job is to protect investors. But you keep in mind that all, all the way up until this, you had the rich. That's why it's the inside secrets, because nobody was really doing angel investing as an angel investor investing into private equity companies. Sure, you had people loaning money to local businesses around them that might be a, be a private banker. I talk about that in my book, Inside Secrets to Angel Investing. Yeah, and sure, you had silent partners that were still doing their thing, right? You had some of that stuff happen. You still had alternative investors that were investing into speculative things like a, a oil field or a gold mine or something like that. You still had those kind of folks that were out there, but they don't they didn't really think of themselves as angel investors, right? And so our a couple of things happen. One, crowdfunding on a reward base had started to happen. And uh, think about the things that we take for granted now. So people are the other day asking me, well, well, who, what kind of companies get angel investing? And I have to take them serious. I really have to do it with a straight poker face because I'm, I'm just so stunned sometimes when people ask me that question. And I said, everything you can think of, Home Depot wouldn't be here if it wasn't for angel investors. Microsoft wouldn't be here. Amazon, eBay, PayPal, all of those tech companies, none of them would, my, did I say Microsoft already? None of them would exist if it wasn't for angel investors. Okay, Dell Computer, all of them, right? iPhones, every technology that, you know, they advance it is certain, but Google, Google wouldn't be here if it wasn't for angel investors. Things that we take for granted, but not even the things that we take, like that kind of stuff. You think about um, vacuum cleaner technology or, uh, like thermos technology or things like the fidget widget, right? Things, things that we, that we, we clocks. I mean, so if you look at the industry of things that we take for granted now, 3D printers, drones, smartwatches, the widget fidget I just picked up, all of those got to even AR, VR, the Oculus headset. All of that came to market under crowdfunding reward base. That means people went out and bought the product prior to, to, prior to it being able to be released in commercially. They, they wanted that product. And I remember back in, it was probably 2008 timeframe. I was like, all this stuff is happening, crowdfunding, crowdfunding is all the rage and all this stuff. And I remember the chart came out and it had, what were the top, out of the top 20 companies, the types of companies, and like four of them were 3D printers. And I'm like, who's, and, 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 and like three were drones. And I'm like, who's investing in that? Well, venture capitalists and real early market adopters were investing in it to learn about it and, and, and play around with it and uh, get access to these, to these products because they wanted to know where the direction was going, right? And so they were, but those millions of dollars that went into bringing those products, all the people that invested in those or, or put that money to get that product early, those early releases, they didn't make a dime like on the Oculus headset when Facebook put a hundred million dollars into it. You know, they didn't make a dime when, um, you know, the smart watches went into market and got, you know, I talk about this in a presentation I do to economic um, departments that an economic chamber of commerce is that says, this is why you need to encourage angel investing in your community. And so um, the, the, our, our elected leaders realized they needed to do two things in order to jumpstart our small business economy, jumpstart our economy, which became the Jobs Act. They needed to do two things. One, they needed to turn the market around and make it easier for entrepreneurs to get access to capital because they couldn't go to the banks. The banks had, were out, didn't have money. There was a, a financial crisis. They also needed to be able to provide an opportunity, what we call the great economic democratization of the capital markets, an opportunity for investors of all sizes and income levels to be able to invest in the next big thing, to let them create wealth, not by being necessarily being that successful entrepreneur, but by investing in that successful entrepreneur. Because if you go to the top 50 wealthiest people in, in the world, yeah, some of them are generational wealth, 
But where did they originally create their wealth? They created because they were an entrepreneur. Somebody in that family initially was an entrepreneur and created vast wealth that they carry forward in family trusts today, family offices today, investing in other businesses, investing in real estate, investing in stock markets, leveraging and diversifying to make sure that they have 10th, 12th, 13th generational wealth. Okay. The Carnegie Mellons, the DuPonts, the Walmarts, the Sam Waltons, the all of them, but you know, they all created generational wealth and their investors got wealthy along with them, right? And then maybe depending on where they were, they invested or started up a company or in it and it fueled itself forward. But if you look at the top people, they're all entrepreneurs or they're now managing large investment capital things, but they're also investing in entrepreneurs, right? Elon Musk was a success, is, is a successful entrepreneur right? Uh, all of them are, you know, made their money, the ones that are in, in the space race, they all made their money as entrepreneurs. But along the way, a lot of people made money as investors without all the risk of being that entrepreneur. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. Take your, take your mid-year mid hump and go get the Inside Secrets to Angel Investing book, right? If you're timid and you not want to spend 20 bucks to get the Inside Secrets to Angel go get the free ebook. Okay. <laughs> and then buy the book. But yeah, so because this is the reason why, right? This is why the Jobs Act, when they looked at the numbers. So in 2009, the stock market had collapsed um, significantly and people's retirement and their investments was wiped out. It took five years for the stock market to get back to just a normal a baseline, right? So they lost everything on an S&P 500 and then for it to get back. So you only really lost if you sold your money. But during that time, what was the, what was the law, the future net present value of that money that wasn't making any money? It was only getting back to, to zero, right? You know, and on average, if you look at the total amount over for 20, 30 years, it's on average is 10.7%. Right. If you if you five years to get back in the in long term, it's like a, t, a you know, a, a 10, 10.7 uh, rate of return, annual rate of return. Now, it does accumulate if you just sit on that stock. And that's why you should have that in there. But if you want to have a larger return, I mean, you look at real estate, right? The average real estate over a 10 year period of time is 10.6. Right. That's how much they gain each year. Whereas you look at the average for an angel investor, the average is 27% internal rate of return. They, they expect to get 3.5%, 350%, three, three and a half times their money, or two, two I'm sorry, two, 260 percent of their initial investment in three and a half years, or and and over a long period of time. Because of diversification, Australia, the average internal rate of return is 27%. That's what in angel investors expect. And experienced ones that have are part of a system and use a system with this and use due diligence screeners like what we offer at Cougar and Capital Holdings, what I did for a decade for investors that when my angel group, the Network of Business Angel Investors, was becoming the top 50 in the country, Right. They you they have a system and a process. And I talk about it in the book, which leads me to the resource portal. So the resource portal, when you get your book, if you go in here, it's listed in the intro and all through how you go to the portal and you log in, you use your secret word and you get access to it. You get due diligence checklists, you get spreadsheets, to do calculations with and do your valuation stuff and samples of of contracts and documents and questions to ask the entrepreneur when you do your follow-up meeting and a, a tool to screen and score them for $19.99 plus shipping. And if you're a prime, you don't even have to pay for shipping. And if you want an autograph one, you can also go get it through the website, but it's 40%, 31 to 40% for that. Right. And so it's, it's, it's on average, three times that of the stock market and the real estate market. And guess what? A whole class of people in the United States, 90% of the people in the United States were not allowed to participate in these 
types of transactions up until 2012 and beyond when the real rules came in in 2015, when you had, um, you know, you had various, the Reg A plus, then the Reg D 506 C, then the crowdfunding Reg CF, and then interstate, which is now uh, Reg, Reg D 504 for interstate exemptions. And all of that is talked about in the book. And I have, I talk about that on other podcasts. I'm not going to talk about that now. I just really want to stress to you the value, not only to can you make more money, but you get great satisfaction. This is where the compassion part comes out, knowing that you have invested in another entrepreneur's dream. And so business owners out there, a lot of my investors in my angel group when I was running it were business owners. They were making millions of dollars in their own business and decided to carve out a hundred grand to put into other businesses that were around them or other business owners that they liked, that they appreciated. And so you're investing in the passion of an, another entrepreneur, but through that compassion of your investing in private transactions, you bring innovation to the market that may not exist to solve a problem that we have. We have lots of problems to solve in the world. And the only way they get solved is through innovation and finding new ways to solve those problems. And the, the 99% of the time, the government is not going to fund that innovation. Yeah, they do some grant programs and they do this stuff, but it's real because they're solving their own business. And if it has a commercial application, great, but they don't really care. And a lot of that stuff gets invested in by the government that never goes to market because an idea does not make a company. An idea does not make a product. It has to be commercialized. And that's what entrepreneurs do. And there's even, you know, there's so many aspects of things that you can invest in, depending on what, where you are, you can, you can join up with another group of people that you like, that you like their business having, maybe you worked in a business together, like Land Betterman, that podcast I did with those guys. You know, there's so many ways that you can participate in this space of bringing innovation to market and, and taking technology that's developed in universities or technology that's been developed by some smart guy that you met or gal that you met. Or you want to empower those businesses around you and your community so that we, you have a thriving uh, community where there are good jobs in your community. And you want that guy wants to, that guy or gal has been running that business for two years and they want to, to you know, expand and bring manufacturing into the United States and not have it offshore. But they need money to offset what they can qualify for their loans, for their equipment. They need to put equipment in. They need to go buy a building or rent, get a building that they can put this equipment in. You can be the person that helps that happen. That can be you, right? You can have an impact with your money that creates money for you. Capitalism, buying at wholesale, selling at retail with a product that the, that the market wants and is willing to pay for it, right? And the passion and the compassion to make a change with your money because you're not just buying and selling stock that only go, benefits the person sold it, doesn't benefit the company, doesn't bring in a, any innovation in the market, or buying and selling real estate that, you know, I mean, maybe you develop a whole complex where people, you know, but just, build, just buying and selling a fancier house doesn't really benefit anybody in the market. Uh, that, you know, it, 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 it does, but it's but not directly. You know, it's, it's a benefit, but it doesn't make change happen in a community or in a group of people or to solve the problems that we need to solve, to save our planet, to make sure to overcome our economic discrepancies that we have that cause so much of our problems to, you know, benefit the world in, in, and, you know, they don't, we're getting power, getting, getting food you know, all the things that we can benefit when we take the money off the sidelines and put it to work with entrepreneurs that are hungry and eager and want to put their thumbprint on the world. So join the compassionate capitalist movement, figure out where you fit as an angel investor in this whole millennium, where it's as a crowdfunding investor, as a local invest in a business down the street investor, invest in your neck next big, huge startup, 
that's going to become a billion dollar unicorn. Whatever that is, you can figure that out when you get my book, Inside Secrets to Angel Investing. So I'm sorry that this has been an infomercial for the book, but you've got to get it and get it and sign up on the website to get the book and sign up for the resource portal. Then you get my promo that you're not going to want to miss because it's going to be the difference between whether investors make money or lose money and waste a bunch of time in the next six months. And that's me, Karen Rance, onward and upwards. Inside Secrets to Angel Investing.com. Thanks.